Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the first of three webinars uh, in this Your Guide to Doing Business in China series, which is being brought to you by Hawksford in conjunction with us here at the China Britain Business Council, um, or CBBC, um, as we go for short. Um, today, we are going to hear a bit more about how to choose the correct um, structure for your business in China. Um, and what factors come into play with that. Um, and the next two webinars are on the 24th of September and the 8th of October, and they respectively will cover Hawksford's five essential tips for doing business in China and the five steps to successful integration of your business in China. Uh, full details and sign-up links are on the CBBC website, cbbc.org, and if you go to the events page there, uh, you'll be able to see um, the links to get uh, signed up for those as well. Uh, just to quickly introduce um, myself and CBBC, um, my name is Jack Porteous, I look after the retail and e-commerce sector for CBBC, um, and we as an organization help British and Chinese businesses and organizations work together in China, the UK, and third markets around the world. We have 65 years of experience, experts in 11 UK offices, and 15 Chinese offices. We support companies of all sizes and sectors, whether they're new entrants to the market or established operations, to realize the full potential of the fastest growing market in the world. Our unrivaled network of 130 staff across 26 locations in the UK and China understand the geographical, sectoral, and cultural aspects of business success in China. This personal expertise is complemented by a range of events, research, and services tailored to meet the specific requirements of companies. We also leverage the knowledge of our members, such as we are doing today with Hawksford, to ensure that our clients can access the best advice and services, whatever stage of market entry they are at. Um, we also work really closely with the UK government, the Department for International Trade and various other departments, um, but are an independent organisation and we offer trusted impartial advice and while maintaining close partnerships with both UK and Chinese governments. Um, it's really a pleasure to be introducing this webinar um, and both myself personally and CBBC more widely have been doing a lot of work with Hawksford recently who have been providing a huge amount of um, benefit to a great number of our clients um, through uh, delivered services, through a bit of informal advice, um, and they um, are really positioning themselves as a as, as one of the experts on on the topics that they're presenting in this webinar series over the next uh, three weeks. So it's fantastic that they uh, are doing this webinar series with us. Um, as I said today, um, we are talking about how you choose the correct business structure when you incorporate in China. Um, and this is something that, that myself and other colleagues at CBBC are asked about probably on a daily basis. Um, so is it right to choose your fully owned entity or WUFI as they're known, um, a rep office, or to enter a joint venture uh, with your partner? Um, so today, Francesca, um, from Hawksford, Francesca uh, Scorticini, uh, I apologize if I've, I've pronounced that wrong, Francesca, um, will be giving us a rundown of what these structures are um, and the factors you need to take into consideration to make the best decisions for your business. Um, I held a seminar with Francesca um, in our office about a year ago um, on, on a very similar topic uh, that included this and her level of experience and knowledge in this area is exemplary so please make use of this opportunity to ask her questions uh, using the chat box provided i'm sure you can see it on your control panel on the right hand side um, those questions will be coming through um, and at the end we'll have a q and a section where francesca will hopefully be able to to answer some of those queries. So make the most of that opportunity uh, and make sure if today um, helps you understand what your next steps are that you reach out to Hawksford and ourselves at CBBC uh, for uh, the next stage of advice. Um, so I will now hand back over uh, to Francesca, um, who is going to deliver the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much everyone for joining us. Thanks, Jack, for the introduction, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for attending today's webinar. 
As you know, foreign investors conducting business operations in China are required to register a formal legal presence. And the aim of today's presentation is to introduce the most common ways of making business in China for multinational companies. Before starting, let me introduce briefly who we are. Um, Oxford is uh, specialized in uh, providing services and advisory for inbound uh, investment to China and Asia in general. We serve more than 1,000 multinational companies in different industries, and we provide comprehensive package of services, including market entry advisory, company setup, accounting, tax, and human resource services, as well as uh, tailor-made solutions for different needs. We have uh, five offices in China, including Shanghai, Changshu, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen and also in Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Japan, Jersey, London, Milan, and Barcelona in Europe. Our structure enables us to assist our clients in doing business throughout China and Asia from our direct offices or local partnerships. Next slide. My name is uh, Francesca Scortichini. I lead a team of associates in China that we call account managers, composed by multilingual professionals with the international background, assisting our clients in daily needs, liaising and facilitating the communication between the local staff, institutions, and clients. Okay, now let's start with our presentation. There are three different forms of legal presence in China for multinational companies, uh, namely representative office, WUFI, uh, WOLI for foreign-owned enterprises, and joint ventures. Today, we will describe their main characteristics, pros and cons. So let's say you have decided to start an entrepreneurial activity in China, to sell your products in China, manufacture in China, sourcing materials and products. What's the first step to start your business and what's the most appropriate way to do it? Every company has its own strategy and short or long-term goals that shall be taken in, into consideration when planning the investment into the Chinese market. In addition to that, you have to evaluate your current structure and understand how much resources, efforts you can invest into this market to achieve your goals. Without the intention to be exhaustive, today's presentation will give you just a general view of this topic to help you to decide which is the most suitable investment form for your company if you are planning to enter into this market. If you have any specific question, feel free to contact us after this presentation. We have a Q&A session or uh, any time. The first investment method we introduced today is the representative office. A representative office is not a legal entity. It's just a liaison office between the foreign company, the Chinese customers, suppliers, and local offices. It's an extension of the foreign company in the Chinese territory with a very limited business scope. A liaison office in practice is allowed to do marketing research, liaising with Chinese customers and suppliers, attending promotional activities, display the goods of the mother company, but it cannot engage in any direct business operations or any other activity that can generate revenues. Usually, foreign companies set up a representative office to gain experience and test the market, to understand the size and the opportunities for the future business development in China. Therefore, usually the representative office has a limited duration, although there are no legal limitations in this respect. 
but it's quite normal to switch from the representative office to another type of entity if the initial test of the market has been positive. The representative office can be established only by foreign companies existing and operating for more than two years. What are the main characteristics? The representative office has no registered capital, and this is certainly an advantage for the foreign investors as it limits the financial exposure and the risk on this market. However, please keep in mind that this is a pure cost center where all the expenses shall be covered by the mother company through international remittance. Therefore, the investment is financially relevant in any case. The representative office must have a registered address, which is a physical address. It cannot hire employees directly. Since it's not a legal entity, the representative office is not allowed to have a social security and housing fund account, meaning that it cannot pay the mandatory social benefits to employees. Therefore, all the staff must be employed by a qualified dispatching agency and then dispatched to the representative office. The representative office will borne all the costs, including salaries, bonuses, benefits, social insurance, in addition to a service fee to the employment agency. The representative office can hire only four foreigners at maximum. Compared to other types of entities, they have a shorter incorporation procedure that takes uh, only a few weeks. However, the deregistration procedure can be as complicated as the one for a normal legal entity. Although they cannot generate profits uh, by definition, representative offices are subject to tax, including corporate income tax. So in practice, all the costs typically rent, HR costs, reimbursement, traveling expenses, accounting and administrative costs shall be converted into revenues and will become the taxable base for the calculation of the corporate income tax. In addition to that, they are subject to VAT and surcharges. They have accounting and tax duties, although simplified, for example, a quart on a quarterly basis instead of monthly, as well as yearly compliance requirements, such as annual audit and annual reporting. For this purpose, the mother company has to submit legalized and notarized registration certificates to the Chinese authorities every year. The second investment method that we are discussing today is the WUFI, a wholly foreign owned enterprise. WUFIs are investment vehicles entirely owned by a foreign natural or legal person. WUFIs are limited liability companies, meaning that the shareholder is liable for the company's debts and liabilities only up to the registered capital. A WUFI can be classified in three types based on the nature of the business scope, consulting, trading, and manufacturing. Consulting companies are allowed to provide services, and this is the easiest and quicker company type to be established as they don't have a custom license. It takes approximately three months or even less than that. Industries falling into this category are uh, typically logistics, business consulting, sourcing and quality control, restaurants, management companies, IT, amongst others. In some specific industries, additional licenses are required, such as uh, the NVOCC license, the non-vessel operating common carrier for the logistic companies, and the food and catering permit for restaurants. The trading companies are allowed to engage in any purchase and sale activity throughout different channels, such as direct sales, wholesale, 
e-commerce e within China and also import and export, as well as providing supplementary services in relation to the traded goods. The overall setup procedure generally takes uh, from three to four months. And for trading of specific products, it is required a special license, um, such as uh, the food business permit to sell any kind of prepacked food, wholesale or retail alcohol permit for the distribution of wine. The last type, the manufacturing companies are permitted to produce goods assemble, purchase raw materials and components, and sell finished or semi-finished goods. Amongst the three types of companies, the manufacturing ones have the most extensive business scope, being permitted to include also trading activities and services in the same business scope. The setup procedure in this case is generally longer than the other types uh, of companies, Mm, the other type of companies uh, taking more than five months as uh, it needs to pass an environmental impact assessment and also obtain manufacturing permit in some cases. What are the main reasons to choose a WUFI uh, to enter into the Chinese market? Um, Having a WUFI allows the investor to have absolute control of the group strategy and its implementation to pursue long-term goals in this market. Having a WUFI in China will allow you to engage in all the activities and operations within your business scope, entering in purchase and sales agreement, employ directly local staff with no limitation in the number of locals and foreigners. As opposed to representative offices, a WUFI can generate revenue, can issue invoices to clients, can deduct VAT and receive payments from customers, either from China or, or overseas in RMB or in other currencies. Moreover, a company, can benefit from financial subsidies granted by local authorities under certain circumstances, or can obtain foreign or domestic loan from other companies or banks, as well as other financing solutions. From tax perspective, the losses generated by the company can be deducted and carried forward within five years. There is no minimum capital requirement, meaning that you can decide how much capital invest in your company and you can inject it on a later stage in accordance with the article of association, even in 30 years. However, we recommend, we always recommend not to underestimate the capital and register an amount that is sufficient to cover the expenses for daily operations until the company is able to generate a sufficient cash flow. This is uh, to avoid lack of funds and even business interruption. It is true that the company can always increase the registered capital at any time, However, the procedure is not that quick and uh, as it needs to be registered at several offices, banks, etc. What do you need to know to incorporate a WUFI and how long does it take? Once the incorporation documents are well prepared and ready, you can obtain the business license in 30 days, so in a relatively short time. However, a big part of the work shall be done before and after the incorporation in SEM. Why? Planning to invest in, a Chinese mar in the Chinese market requires to pay attention to many different aspects. For example, as the first step, to identify the right office. In order to incorporate a WUFI, it is mandatory to have a registered address that must be a physical address in a commercial business building or in a business center, for example, if you are a trading company. This is not an easy job, especially when you are not based in China and don't have a very clear idea 
um, in which district your office should be registered or how big it should be, etc. It is possible to change the register address later. However, uh, this is a quite a long and complicated process, especially if the new office should be located in another district or in, or in another city. So at the beginning, the head company has to enter in a rental agreement before the Chinese subsidiary is incorporated. And after the rent contract can be transferred to the WUFI itself. Then, you, you need to choose the right company name in Chinese for your Wufi. And this is not just a translation exercise of the English name of the company, because uh, as you know, the corresponding Chinese characters may have a meaning which is not suitable for the market. And moreover, there are certain rules to follow when choosing the company name. Third, you have to decide your company structure and governance. The company must have a legal representative, local or foreigner, that can be appointed as an executive director, and this is called simplified governance, or you can appoint a board of directors of minimum three members. This is called complex governance. It is then mandatory to appoint a supervisor with the role of supervising the directors and the senior management. And it can be a single supervisor or a board of supervisor. The, uh, these are only some of the information that you will have to think about and plan carefully when you have to decide to incorporate uh, a WUFI. Um, while uh, now it's possible to obtain the business license uh, in a relatively short time, as we said before, even in 30 days, the so-called post-registration formalities, uh, such as opening the bank accounts, uh, tax registration, custom registration, may require more time and be more challenging than obtaining the business license. Compared to some years ago, the incorporation process today is uh, faster. However, now it's more and more requested by the offices to meet the legal representative in person as one of the fundamental steps to complete the setup procedure. So assuming the, the legal representative is a foreign citizen, usually the bank required to verify uh, the original passport passport and eventually to have a video call with him or she. Uh, meanwhile, the tax officers required to have a face-to-face -face meeting at some stage. Therefore, it is very likely that he or she has to plan a visit to China for the finalization of the incorporations procedure. The last investment method that we will describe today is the joint venture. Joint venture is a company established in partnership with a Chinese partner. It is forbidden to Chinese natural persons to, um, person to participate to foreign ventures. Uh, therefore, your local partner shall have the form of a company. Joint ventures are independent legal entities with limited liabilities. And there are two different types of joint venture. Equity joint ventures, where the partners share profits and risks in proportion to their equity contribution. And cooperative joint ventures, where the profits are allocated according to the terms of the shareholding agreement rather than the proportion of the registered capital. Cooperative joint ventures are typically formed to develop projects with limited duration or and uh, with specific objects, for example, the development of a building. Generally, there is no minimum investment requirement for Chinese partners in a joint venture pro project. However, according to the company law of China, uh, it is required 
required that the foreign party contributes no less than 25% of registered capital. The capital contribution to an equity joint venture can be made in form of cash, equipment, machinery, technology, and other assets. And the value of the in-kind contribution will be then subject to evaluation by the relevant authorities. What can you do with a joint venture? In recent years, the Chinese authorities have opened the market more and more to foreign ventures in many services and manufacturing sectors, reducing the negative list of prohibited and restricted industries. Currently, foreign companies have restrictions to operate in certain businesses where they can engage only in the form of joint ventures. As an example, um, education in certain fields, for example, preschool, college, high education institution, telecommunication, broadcast media services, public air transportation services, manufacturing of vehicles in a world with some exceptions, uh, for example, in the production of special use vehicles or new energy vehicles, certain types of constructions, etc. In these cases, the Chinese partner must have the majority of the equity investment. It has been already announced that, that some of these restrictions, uh, for example, in the manufacturing of vehicles, uh, will be removed in the coming years. So now, um, at this moment, one of the main reasons to enter in a joint venture is uh, to have access to restricted industry that at this moment are not permitted to a wholly foreign owned enterprise. Although your company doesn't operate in one of the restricted sectors, you can still choose to enter the Chinese market with a joint venture company for strategic reason, reasons, for example, to have access to know-how, techno technology, and the distribution channels uh, of the local partners. These uh, will allow you to penetrate the market uh, in a shorter time. How easy is to set up a joint venture? The procedure to incorporate a foreign joint venture is the same of the WUFI, technically. However, the incorporation process is usually longer and more complex, as one of the most critical parts is uh, the drafting of the article of association of the company and the shareholders agreement, uh, where each party has to agree on important matters uh, that usually require a long negotiation and typically are the exit conditions and governance. The governance structure is more complicated, is more complex, as it requires to appoint a board of directors instead of a sole director, as every party shall be represented in the management structure. Meanwhile, the, uh, the, the parties can decide to um, appoint alternative alternatively for some years, some strategic uh, people in um, some positions, for example, legal representative or a CFO. Although the, the rotation of legal representative is feasible and usually is uh, one of the best practice, uh, it requires to go through a certain procedure that is relatively time consuming and expensive. Moreover, for all the major decisions regarding companies' alteration um, that requires an amendment of the article of association, such as a capital increase, change of registered address, merger, termination of the entity, it is required the unanimous approval from the board of directors. Another critical aspect in joint ventures company is the protection of the intellectual property rights. 
So in general, joint venture companies are complex to be managed successfully, also due to cultural differences between partners and the difficulties in controlling. This is why in recent years, probably WUFIs are the preferred investment method for foreign companies. I can give you one real example from the retail industry. In 1998, when we believed it was impossible, the first WUFI company was established by, for the trading of male clothes and fashion accessories. Today, this company has over, over 120 shops overall China. In recent times, many fashion brands that entered the market years ago through a distributor are now taking back the shops and assets to manage the retail operations directly through their booths. In 1999, the first joint venture company um, was established for manufacturing and trading of female clothes. The first joint venture company um, speaking about Italian fashion brands. But uh, due, the joint venture was a failure due to poor implementation of the group strategy, lack of control, cultural differences. And today, the company doesn't exist anymore in China and not even in Italy. Now, once you have established your vehicle to enter the Chinese market, is it possible to switch from one investment form to another one? It depends. If your initial form is a representative office, you can't change it into a WUFI on a later stage. There is no such simple direct conversion way to, uh, according to the Chinese law. The only way is uh, to register the representative office uh, and set up an entirely new company in the form of the WUFI. However, um, being the two entities are completely independent, uh, it, it is possible to set up a WUFI first and then transfer the employees to the new, from the dispatching agency to the new WUFI after the business license is obtained. At the same time, in parallel, the representative office can start the deregistration procedure. And as a first step, it will be required to settle all the outstanding tax payable. This is usually the most critical part as the tax authorities have the right to, and they generally do, conduct tax investigations that may take several months before being closed. Of course, it makes sense for some companies to open a representative office at first, if this is the first approach with the Chinese market, and if you want to study the consumers and understand if the product will be appealing or not for this market. On the other hand, if you already have tested your products and seen potentials of future growth, it may be more suitable to invest directly with a WUFI. It just depends on different companies' circumstances. However, if you have a WUFI or a joint venture, you can pass from one company type to the other one, typically with a capital increase or an equity transfer. In conclusion, from the comparison of the different forms of investments, we have understood that every investment method has peculiarities, pros and cons, and there is no best option in absolute terms, as the choice shall be always be made, taking, uh, taking into consideration the company's short-term goals, long-term goals, strategy, and also the current structure and situation of the company.
I have concluded my presentation now and um, we can open at this point the Q&A session. So if you have any question or cl clarification that you would like to ask, please write it in the panel and send to us. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, this is Jack from CBBC. Uh, that was that was really, really useful um, and really interesting. Um, one uh, quick question I had, which um, I think you covered. Um, with woofies, uh, one of the questions we always get asked, so I think this is worth repeating, is what the uh, capital investment requirement is um, at the start. Is there an easy answer to that question or is it different for every company? Okay, um, legally speaking, there is no minimal, minimum capital requirement for, for Woofy anymore. Uh, it has been abolished a few years ago. So now the company is, the investor is uh, totally free to invest any amount of funds into the, the Woofy. Um, also, there is no time limitation. Uh, it means that the investor can contribute the capital uh, in a, uh, in a uh, timeline that is uh, um, disclosed in the article of association. And it can be 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years. So uh, there is a lot of flexibility in this respect. However, um, this, is, this is an advantage, of course, because the company can choose to limit its risk and uh, um, uh, liabilities in this market. However, uh, we always recommend clients not to underestimate the capital that is required to uh, enter in this market, especially in the beginning uh, phase of the business, um, of the business, uh, you probably will have more costs than profits. Probably profits will uh, come later than you expect. And uh, at the same time, you need, you need cash flow, you need uh, capital and funds to uh, make your business running every day. So to import goods, to pay your employees, to pay rent, etc. So we always ask, um, suggest our clients to uh, consider and plan very carefully these uh, um, capital amount um, because it will be um, it will be useful in the future. It will prevent um to incur in situation where you run out of cash immediately and you cannot even um, run your business uh, um, anymore temporarily on a um, it's always possible to increase uh, the register capital so if you made a mistake at the beginning you can increase it later at any time and how many times you want however you have to consider that to increase the um, the registered capital, uh, it's required. Uh, it is required to go through uh, formal procedures. It is required to submit an application to several offices in China, update, uh, article, uh, amend the article of association, business license, etc., and also banks. And this normally takes time. Uh, takes time, so um, there, there can be a, a lag, a gap uh, by um, when you need your funds to run your business operations and when you are actually able to get these funds uh, into your bank account and use it. Great, that was really comprehensive. It sounds um... <laughs> quite complicated and uh, something you've said a few times is the importance of getting it right uh, at the start because it saves a lot of a lot of trouble later on so it sounds like anybody listening to the webinar would uh, would do well to speak to you before they uh, before they make any uh, decisions um i think Cindy yeah. and Katerina you are the uh, as the organizers you can see the questions um so if any have come in 
uh, you will be able to see them and I don't think Francesca and I uh, can. Um, so if you um, can send them over to us, that'd be great. I received a question because Cindy is actually uh, close yeah, to right. me here. <laughs> So um, one question is, um, um, do I need to set up a company in Hong Kong before, before as a holding company? Any advantages? Um, it is true that a substantial part of foreign investments uh, into China are made from Hong Kong, uh, meaning that usually European companies uh, structure uh, their um, their business operations through a subsidiary, a vehicle in Hong Kong owned by the European company or the foreign company, and then invest into China through the Hong Kong vehicle. Um, when you decide to expand into China, you have to consider which strategy you want to adopt in this region, not only in China. And um, of course, you can consider whether to um, invest from, from Hong Kong or, or not. It's not mandatory, um, but it can make sense in some cases, for example, it always depends on the real situation of the company, on the business, and on the strategies uh, strategy uh, of the company. For example, if you are a fashion retail brand, and uh, then it's likely that your target market is not limited to China, but you want to sell your products and eventually open shops in other jurisdictions in Asia or in Southeast Asia. In this case, it makes sense to establish an Asian headquarter in Hong Kong or Singapore and investing into China through it. So if you are planning to have real business operations in these countries as well, it makes sense to have a vehicle in these jurisdictions, um, Hong Kong and Singapore, I would say, um, are the most common one um, as uh, they are common law, they have a common law um, ju judicial system, they are flexible, less bureaucratic, uh, transparent, uh, and they also have a favorable, do, um, uh, favorable uh, double taxation agreement in place uh, with China. Um, um, I've got one more question. This, if you've yeah. if you've not got any more, um, if you agree, I can uh, reply one question that we yeah, uh, received uh, in the registration form. Yep. Um, the question is: How long does it take to register class two A medical device in China? If you're a medical device, um, if you if our medical device is a second generation device. This question is concerning companies in the pharmaceutical sectors, uh, um, sector, but I, I thought it may be interesting um, to, um, to talk a little bit. Um, for the registration of class two medical device, the estimated timeline according to the related regulation is approximately 93 working days, as there are several steps from the moment when the application of the registration is submitted until the class two medical device registration certificate is issued. In practice, it can take even longer as a technical evaluations shall be made by external experts as well. For second generation devices uh, or uh, for those devices that are like a development of, uh, mm, of a, a former version, um, in case that there are no substantial changes uh, in the design, raw materials, production technologies, scope of application and application method, which do not affect the safety and effectiveness of such medical devices, then there is no need to apply for the registration of modification. 
However, the information of changes shall be reported to the competent department for record. So in this case, you can uh, avoid the formal procedure of registration. You just need to file um, and uh, uh, register the information of change uh, with the competent office. Okay, is that is that it for questions? I see we're kind of running to the end of our time now um, as well. Um, so if there are any more questions, are people okay to contact you directly? Yes, sure. Perfect, okay. Um, in that case, um, shall we leave it there for the day? Yes, we received uh, some more inform uh, more questions, but uh, if we don't have time, please feel free to I, um, to contact me uh, after the presentation at any time. Great, and as well, you've got the contact details of the people who asked those questions as well, so uh, you yes. can drop them a quick note just to say uh, what the answer is. Yes, yes, we can see the questions and the people who asked, so um, we will reply one by one. Fabulous. Okay, thank you very okay. much everybody for uh, signing up to this webinar. As I said, uh, Hawksford are doing another two uh, webinars with us. This is parts one uh, and three. Uh, the next ones are on the 24th of September and the 8th of October, um, and they are covering. Uh, Hawksford's five essential tips for doing business in China and the five steps to successful integration of your business in China. If you've got time, please do join them uh, and we look forward to hearing from you all. And